No, China's economy is not going to collapse as so many finance YouTubers are claiming. I mean, YouTube was filled with these kind of thumbnails and so I decided to click on one. China is crumbling. And another. Complete disintegration of the Chinese economy. And another. And how this could quite literally lead China to the edge of the next Great Depression in a very short amount of time. And a very short amount of time is apparently 29, 28, 27, 25 days. And sure, China seems to be in big trouble with a massive real estate crisis, bank runs, harsh COVID lockdowns, capital flight, and a growth model that has quite literally run out of steam. But in my humble opinion, the clickbaity Great Depression or complete collapse scenario is extremely unlikely for two reasons. First, China's political system is nothing like that of the US when it entered the Great Depression. Second, China's economy is nothing like that of Asian economies that are actually collapsing, such as Sri Lanka. So let's get into these two differences. Sure, at first sight, the Chinese situation seems an awful lot like the collapse of the US banking system in the early 1930s and in 2008. These two banking crises led to economic collapses that were so catastrophic that they came to be known as the Great Depression and the Great Recession, respectively. So let's have a look how China's situation compares to these two dramatic events. The story of the Great Depression starts with an epic growth of bank lending as well as a massive increase in asset prices, mainly in the stock market. In a similar way, the story of the Great Recession starts with epic credit growth paired with huge asset price increases, mainly in property, and the stock market. So far, this is extremely similar to China's story. From 2009 onwards, Chinese banks and other financial institutions went on a lending spree, causing a huge spike in property prices. This ended up making Chinese cities like Shenzhen and Shanghai four times more expensive relative to income than a city like New York in 2020. So far, so similar. And clearly, asset prices, compared to the size of the economy, cannot rise forever. So asset prices had to come down at some point in all three cases. Then, in all three cases, banks that made loans backed by these assets started to fail. Unsure of whether their money was safe or not, people started to demand their money back from the banks. And in any modern banking system, all people wanting their money back at the same time is simply not possible. So in all three cases, people wanted to be the first to get their money out of the banking system, sparking a bank run. This is where China is now and this is also where the stories of the Great Recession and Great Depression started to diverge. To which we will get after a word from our sponsor, Morning Brew. As probably many of you, I like to start my day by diving into the latest economic and financial news. However, scrolling through different websites to cover the latest developments can be rather tiresome. So to bring a bit of structure to my morning reading, I've started using Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter delivered Monday through Sunday that helps me get up to speed on the latest developments in business, finance and tech in just five minutes. Through witty, irrelevant and informative reporting, Morning Brew makes topics that are sometimes densely and boringly delivered by traditional media come to life and easily digestible. Morning Brew even gave me a new idea for an upcoming video after reading Ray Dalio's views on China as the next global superpower. So if you're interested in finance, business or tech and want to stay up to date through an entertaining daily update, I suggest you head over to morningbrewdaily.com slash MNM. Or click the link in the description to sign up for their newsletter. It's completely free and only takes 15 seconds to subscribe. All right, back to why China's bubble is different than those in the US. You see, at the start of the Great Depression, the US central bank basically let the banking system collapse. And let's be honest, for any normal business that gets into trouble, it's completely normal that the government just lets it collapse. The problem is that as a system, banks facilitate both payments and credit creation for the entire economy. So letting them go bust is a little bit like letting all your electricity companies go bust at the same time. It might be justified from a moral perspective, but you kill your entire economy in the process. In the case of the US, it took a decade for the economy to recover. However, in 2008, after seeing the damage done by the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank did end up rescuing the financial system. Again, not fair to let bankers get away with blowing a bubble. But the US did manage to avoid another Great Depression and ended up with a milder Great Recession. And this is where you'll find out why China's story is different from the Great Depression as well as the Great Recession. 
You see, just like with the Great Recession, China's central bank is well aware of the dangers of letting your complete credit and monetary system collapse just for the sake of teaching people a lesson. It has already lowered its interest rates and started rescuing both banks and property developers. What's more, China's story is now different from the Great Recession in two other important ways. First, its banking system is already, for the most part, state-owned. So a run to get paper money from these banks would be short-lived, since China's central bank can easily provide it. Second, unlike US politicians who waited for the bubble to collapse on its own, the Chinese bubble was popped by the government itself. Specifically, when it implemented the three red lines policy, which required bad property developers to start deleveraging. So in summary, China's economy will not collapse in a US style Great Depression, precisely because China's central bank has learned the most important lesson from the US Great Depression. Yes, reckless behavior by banks should be punished, but not by crashing your entire economy. What's more, I think China's crisis will not even be as severe as the Great Recession. The reason for this is that the Chinese government values stability more than the US government. So I suspect it will try to spend its way out of trouble more forcefully. But then again, at this point, you might say you cannot compare China to the United States because the US issues the global reserve currency. It has more room to spend its way out of trouble because it's basically funded by foreign countries that desperately need dollars. And one key feature of China's current problems is that international investors seem to be fleeing the country in droves. So maybe it shouldn't be compared to the US, but rather to other Asian economies that are currently collapsing in an inflationary death spiral such as Sri Lanka. Well, no. And here's why. The reason that China can save its banking system if it wants to is that unlike Sri Lanka, China has achieved monetary independence. And it achieved this in two ways. The first way was by becoming a manufacturing superpower. I mean, by the latest calculations, it accounts for one fifth of the world's manufacturing output. Therefore, it's not surprising that China has consistently run a trade surplus with the rest of the world. As China's economy slows down and therefore imports less, its trade surplus has even surged to all-time highs. In other words, the world needs Chinese products. Therefore, even though it doesn't issue the world's reserve currency, its central bank has plenty of dollars to spend. And indeed, it will likely spend these to defend the currency and easily offset the effect of fleeing international investors. This will help it avoid a Sri Lanka style collapse. But then again, as we saw in February, when the Russian ruble absolutely collapsed, a trade surplus alone is not enough. Russia's problem at the time was that while many dollars were coming into central bank coffers via exports, Russian citizens were rushing to get even more money out of the country. This was the same for Turkey, where people don't trust the government and thus dumped liras to buy gold, crypto and dollars. And this brings us to the second way in which China has achieved monetary independence, and that is capital controls. You see, capital controls basically mean that you make it extremely difficult for money to cross borders. And in China's case, it's notoriously difficult to get money out of China as the Chinese government prevents people from taking money out of the country. This is the same type of policy that Russia started implementing in response to Western sanctions. And this clearly helped Russia rescue its currency and avoid a Sri Lanka style collapse. And the combination of capital controls and the trade surplus means that just like the United States, China has the monetary independence to create as much of its own currency as it wants to rescue its banking system, making a complete collapse extremely unlikely. But all of that being said, China is clearly still in big trouble. In absolute size, its property bubble is the biggest the world has ever seen. And while it's popping the bubble itself, its government has hurt its economy simultaneously in three other main ways. First, its one-child policy from the past now means that it is facing a rapid population decline in the coming decades. More immediately, it is preventing its consumers from spending more by keeping them locked up inside in response to Omicron. Finally, it's cracking down on its relatively productive tech and education industries and the private sector in general. But since it has achieved monetary independence and likely learned the lessons from the US Great Depression, I just don't think that it will crumble, no matter how many sensationalist YouTubers will try to tell you the opposite. Instead, I think that a short recession followed by a major government intervention and then a period of stagnation and slow decline like Japan is the most likely scenario. But hey, 
Okay, I'm deliberately saying scenario. You see, in macroeconomics, just like in politics, I think it's helpful to think in scenarios and then give these a probability. In my mind, the sensationalist YouTube collapse scenario is just as likely as throwing two dice and hitting double six. It's possible, but it's highly unlikely given Xi's focus on social stability and China's monetary independence. On the other hand, I think that a sustainable economic recovery is like hitting double five, double four or double three. More likely, but still, Unlikely. Finally, all other combinations of the dice represent a Japan-style stagnation scenario. But what do you think? How likely do you think that each of these scenarios is? Either let me know in the comments or consider joining our member and patron exclusive Discord community where we will discuss this issue further in depth. In any case, I will keep covering the situation as it unfolds. So make sure to subscribe. And if you want to know more about the Japan style scenario, check out this video over here. And if you want to know more about the global economy's debt problem, check out this interview over here.